great to go. Okay. So, uh, as, as it was mentioned that uh, today's talk is about introduction to space missions. And uh, this whole, whole talk, uh, rather even the events before which we conducted uh, related to space has its story, which actually originated from the textbook, uh, which you have in the 10th standard. And uh, actually it was my school teacher when I had gone to my school where I stay at Cherny Road. And my school teacher showed me this new textbook. I think this uh, new textbook was launched somewhere in the year 2017, 18 uh, as a new curriculum. And uh, that is when my school teacher showed me, uh, look Chintamani here, these are interesting topics which have been introduced in the grade 10 syllabus. And uh, I, was I was really excited and happy to know to see chapters like gravitation and space missions. And uh, so I'm also sharing the screenshots, the first page from these chapters. And uh, I mean, I, I wished if, when I was in 10th standard, if I could have had these subjects, I could have gone far more. And uh, that is when it was decided, you know, I started thinking what we can do related with these chapters. And that is when my even uh, school teacher admitted that, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, all these topics, uh, they look good, but then, uh, you know, teachers, uh, they really need to be informed how to take these topics to classrooms, how these topics uh, need to be taught to school students. And uh, that is when uh, I started thinking or as an individual and as a part of Space Geeks, uh, you know, how we should take up any events, activities uh, to teach these topics in schools. And that is when uh, I came across uh, sci retired scientists of IWSA who were encouraging enough to actually initiate the first, very first workshop of its kind on school level space and astronomy, which we actually conducted this month, uh, this year uh, in the month of May and where we actually uh, uh, taught school teachers how to take up these topics at school levels. And in fact, introducing online open source simulations where, uh, I mean, in the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, we are really suffering from offline lectures and it has become more difficult to actually teach these topics like space and gravitation. So we, uh, in this workshop, we uh, tried giving our best where we actually taught school teachers how to teach uh, complex topics such as gravitations, Newton laws, and even space missions. So then uh, coming to, to today's topic of space missions, I think uh, today uh, it's basically October 4 to October 10, Worldwide, it is celebrated as World Space Week, but today, especially it's 89th uh, anniversary of Indian Air Force. And all of you must be aware that India is planning uh, its manned mission, Gaganyaan, which is to be uh, uh, launched in the year 2022. And today being uh, 89th anniversary of Indian Air Force, I think uh, uh, we are at right moment to discuss about uh, space missions. And... Uh, uh, as you all know that 12 astronauts initially uh, were uh, 12, uh, 12 Air Force pilots were actually selected as a part of this mission. And uh, among them, then four later were selected. And uh, we hope that uh, this mission is going to bring a great success to India and to the world. And then I also came across uh, the website of the school and where I came where I saw that there, uh, you have a great alumni group captain Shiv Kumar Srinivasan who is actually a Vishishta Seva medal recipient and uh, you all should be proud that uh, uh, it should be an inspiration to all, all those students who are attending here this talk that uh, they can take uh, they can take inspiration from the great alumni of your school and they can also think of joining armed forces and why not Indian Air Force? And why am I discussing about Indian Air Force or in general Air Force? Because uh, it is actually the training of Air Force, which actually trains you for the physical and mental fitness, which is actually required for becoming an astronaut. And uh, that is why most of the astronauts, if you see, they are actually chosen from uh, Air Force wing of those uh, of particular nations, whichever nation is actually launching a uh, space mission. 
but then is it is it that if you are not uh, from air force if you if you cannot become air force pilot of course there is actually requirement to satisfy physical and mental criteria mental fitness physical fitness but then if you are not an air force pilot then can you join uh, can you become an astronaut so yes that is true in fact uh, in the september this year 15 spaces spacex launched its first private crewed mission to space and all these astronauts whom uh, you are seeing right now on the screen they are not from any uh, chosen from any air force they all are civilians and that is what actually uh, the message it, it carries is the space is actually accessible to everyone and that is what actually the mission uh, is carried by spacex uh, i am sure all of the youngsters who are sitting here they all know elon musk and his uh, space endeavors and uh, it is actually showing us that uh, the, the upcoming missions in space are not going to be kind of national pride but they are actually of global significance the space is becoming more global and uh, whether you join isro or nasa or european space agency you know it is actually opening up opportunities in the space sectors and especially uh, you must have also heard that the indian government has taken significant steps to privatize uh, space sector so i am sure there are lot of opportunities to join space sector and that is where it is important that students at your age should get inspired uh, to take up higher studies in stem areas and i hope by uh, giving this talk uh, uh, you all take interest in the field of space and allied areas so coming back to human space missions and space exploration what is the main motivation so the basic factors which actually fascinates about uh, you know by which we get fascinated about space is nothing but humans have always in, aspired to explore the unexplored and to understand what is not understood and space exploration is part of this aspiration imagine a cave man who is actually looking at the dark night sky and i am sure he must have also got inspired to think about what are these twinkling stars and how these stars are twinkling what are the processes what are these different patterns and that is how astronomy actually emerged from uh, the age of cave man and uh, basically the time will come when human species will no longer be will be a part of earth but eventually will settle on moon and mars we we will be actually becoming multiplanetary species and new innovation so it's not about just becoming going on moon and mars but the space technology is rather actually helping us in our daily lives as well uh, and that is actually bringing socio economic benefits i'll be also discussing i'll be touching upon those topics as well and uh, as i said the space has been mankind's major fascination so with that i go to the next slide and as you can see that there are uh, uh, two different uh, uh, gifs being shown and uh, uh, as you can see that there is uh, it was a historic uh, uh, flight on april 16 which actually took on mars okay which was actually ingenuity helicopter by nasa's uh, mars 2020 mission which took actually its first flight on mars and it was actually uh, it took on the 154th birth anniversary anniversary of wilbur wright who actually you can see in the next uh, uh, gif actually where actually the first human flight took off 154 years ago and it was actually since since then the span of one these 154 years we have seen the rapid progress in the field of space science and technologies and that has those and those uh, uh, those uh, that rapid progress has actually emerged into the flight which took on april 16 on mars and i am sure in coming years humans will be actually taking these flights on mars as well then then i come to the slide uh, of vikram descent vikram lander which actually happened on in the year 2019 when all of us we were actually 
seeing like uh, like we watch cricket or football match or you know the the, the olympic matches and uh, it was actually when in the midnight of uh, uh, october 7 2019 we were all watching uh, the landing of chandrayaan 2 on the uh, which was actually the isro's mission and uh, something went wrong when actually uh, uh, you know we were about to touch on the lunar surface and that uh, uh, was a very sad moment i mean there was there was a time when we were organizing event and we saw a complete silence and uh, people were actually waiting what happened what went wrong and uh, we were all eager to hear from the isro headquarters and then it was announced that no we have lost contact with the lander and we wait for uh, further announcement uh, so then uh, it raised all the questions and uh, in country like india uh, you know questions are always raised why we have to spend so much on space missions do we really require uh, that much do we have you know do shall we do do we really spend that much money is it really required for country like india where uh, you know we we see lot of challenges but then the question is yes we need to spend because the money which we are spending right now is actually with a uh, you know it not with a very short sighted vision but with a long vision because the money which is spent for space missions lot of technologies emerge in the long period and those technologies they do not then remain confined just as a part of space missions but they ultimately come down to our daily lives and that is where we actually get socio economically benefited so uh, i'll i'll just play uh, i'll just play the video of chandrayaan 2 i think we all should be uh, proud of chandrayaan 2 mission and uh, let us hope that we all get successful landing on chandrayaan 3 are you all able to hear uh, Yes, yes, sir. We are able to hear.
Pratyan and you can see that uh, its solar panels are actually vertical so from the south pole of the moon you are having sun not overhead but actually near the horizon so how to tilt the solar panel that vertical so so let us pray that uh, in chandrayaan 3 we will successfully uh, land on moon so let me get back to the slide yeah so so as you can see so this slide i have taken from european space mission and as you all can see that this is actually uh, a similar sequence hello you all can hear me right yes sir okay okay i thought i had lost my internet okay yeah so uh, yeah so this is a uh, a sequence of the typical lunar lander and in fact our uh, uh, vikram lander was having a similar design so this slide is taken from a uh, european space agency and uh, so this is a stage at which 100 kilometers the lander was actually orbiting and then a stage comes where lander has to fire its boosters and uh, that is how it actually reduces uh, uh, its orbital velocity as it reduces the orbital velocity its altitude starts decreasing and then it actually turns itself so that it is actually ready for the landing and that is where some something happened which we don't know what happened because uh, it was actually the very first mission from india to land on the south pole of the mission and i'm sure uh, the kind of data we have which we have acquired till now it will actually help us to plan for the chandra and 3 mission so coming to the slide so because everyone uh, as as long as we achieve success everyone claps but uh, when we uh, face failure you know people start uh, Uh, speaking in the background so then the thing is let us look at this graph about the missions which were launched to moon and as you can see from this uh, uh, success and failure diagram of con country wise diagram you can see that in the very first successful in which we actually detected water on the moon in fact we have just launched two missions to moon and it was actually chandra and one mission which was the very first mission which detected water on moon because most of us we are not aware that many missions were launched to the moon and they predicted the presence of water on moon but it was actually the chandra and one mission which could detect water on moon when it actually uh, there were two instruments on chandra and one so one instrument uh, was actually on board the orbiter and the second instrument was actually on the probe which was released from the orbiter and that probe actually traveled uh, all the way from the orbiter and to the lunar surface and during its finite time it it actually measured the you know the presence of different molecules on the lunar surface and around the moon and that is how we actually detected water on the moon and there was the on board instrument which was supplied by nasa uh, the mineralogic mineralogical mapper uh, which also simultaneously detected the presence of water on moon so uh, it, it we should be proud of uh, the way the low budget low budget space missions are planned uh, by our scientists and uh, in these low budget missions we are able to achieve uh, these successes so even we arrive at a failure the failure should be seen as a success story because actually from failure we have to take up learning lessons and from those learning lessons we plan the next mission which then becomes successful though uh, so why we chose the south pole of moon so first of all it is unexplored and, and some of most of the uh, craters on the lunar surface near the south pole are, are actually untouched by the sunlight for billions of years and offering an undisturbed record of the solar system's origin because uh, those things which are untouched by light they are they do not there are no photochemical reactions and since there are no photochemical reactions is actually paves the way to actually probe uh, the origins of the solar system 
and since uh, these are untouched by sunlight and uh, moon doesn't have atmosphere so uh, these surfaces are actually directly exposed to sunlight and if some of these regions are actually permanently shadowed then there is a possibility that these regions will have a large quantity of water and uh, of course the elemental and positional advantage make it very suitable pit stop for future space exploration i'll be also discussing uh, the nasa programs where they want to set up a base on moon and it will be a ground base as well as a base like an orbiter what we have like international space uh, station and that becomes so it's a basically the lunar orbiting base and uh, a ground base on the lunar surface so both will act as a precursor to the missions which will be launched on mars so it will be like uh, you know we will come come to a come to a halt at moon and then from moon we will again take off for mars and uh, lunar surface uh, lunar soil what we call lunar regolith has traces of hydrogen ammonia methane sodium mercury and silver and that becomes very untapped source for essential resources uh, so as we all know the earth based resources the what we call rare earth elements on earth so those elements are not rare on the other space based bodies such as our very moon and uh, some of these rare earth elements are really important for industrial processes uh, and industrial manufacturing and uh that becomes very important to tap these sources whether they are ground based sources or space based sources in fact one of the google co-founders uh, i am aware has actually formed a company to actually tap on these minerals which uh, uh, which are very valuable for industrial processes to actually extract them from asteroids so in near future we'll have asteroid missions which will so you actually uh, send a spacecraft robotic spacecraft that spacecraft lands on asteroid and from asteroid it actually takes the important you know the uh, the massive samples and these samples are then brought to earth or maybe uh, in future we have the lunar base uh, on the lo lunar base itself we'll able to extract the required minerals so what was so special about chandrayaan 2 so chandrayaan 2 will be aided in achieving its mission by some of the india's most advanced engineering marvels and we should be proud that most of the technology was actually uh, invented in india so in fact the lander capable of soft landing on the lunar surface and the whole algorithm because during the landing sequence of the vikram lander it had actually the completely autonomous program and the whole algorithm was actually completely developed by the india scientific community and that rover was actually uh, and the rover which was uh, the pragyan rover it was actually capable of conducting in situ payload experiments and then uh, then coming to the rocket which actually launched chandrayaan 2 it was actually launched by geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle mark 3 jslv mark 3 what we call and uh, the indian media uh, gave it a name as uh, bahubali because because of its huge size and uh, you can uh, see its height is around 43 meters with a lift off mass around 640 tons and uh, perhaps that is why it was called as uh, a uh, fat boy by telugu media and also as bahubali by uh, indian media and it had a uh, three uh, it had three stages uh, it had a solid rocket boosters and followed by a liquid stage and then the upper stage which was actually cryogenic now you will wonder uh, uh, why we require a cryogenic stage can anybody answer does anybody know why we are uh, requiring cryogenic stage anyone among students okay so uh, now you imagine to actually create uh, so first of all the rocket is propelled by exothermic reaction 
and to have exothermic chemical reaction, you need to have an oxidizer. Okay. And uh, if oxidizer itself is in uh, the gaseous phase, okay, the gaseous phase uh, ha occupies a bigger volume. And uh, uh, due to the volume constraints, we cannot afford, okay, the cost wise also and the technology wise, we cannot afford to have a gaseous phase oxidizer. So it is very important to have the oxidizer in a liquid stage. So you have to, uh, so instead of compressing, uh, instead of compressing a gas, it is better to actually reduce its kinetic energy of molecules. And that is how you actually cool, uh, you actually cool the gas. So when the, you are cooling down the gas, the gas molecules reduce their kinetic energy and they become, uh, uh, there is actually a phase transformation to a liquid state. And in fact, the cryogenic stage, that is why we use, because the oxidizer become, is actually in the liquid form. And in the liquid form, you can actually store a large amount of uh, oxidizer, which then used for the exothermic reaction to actually, uh, uh, you know, provide the required thrust when it is in the outer space. Because the cryogenic stage is not activated when we are actually near earth environment. It is only activated when we are in the outer environment. Okay, going to the next slide. So though we are not able to successfully land on moon during Chandrayaan-2, we have a successful orbiter from Chandrayaan-2 mission. And in fact, it is one of, it is the highest resolution camera on board, which is operating at a hundred kilometer orbit. And it has started giving very high resolution Im images of the lunar surface. And it was uh, uh, immediately uh, a tweet came from ISRO uh, in which uh, ISRO said uh, that uh, the high orbit camera is now activated and it is giving us uh, high resolution images. In fact, uh, the lunar maps, which we will develop from the orbiter from Chandrayaan-2 will actually help us to plan Chandrayaan-3 mission. So as I said, uh, that we always wonder why any country, uh, any country uh, in the world spends so much on space missions, but we uh, tend to forget that the spin-offs which actually emerge by such vast expenditure on space domain, we never realize that most of the technologies which are uh, around us, they have actually emerged from the inventions, innovations, which came uh, in the space domain. So uh, generally you must have just seen aero, uh, the aerospace technologies, but uh, uh, the technologies like GPS, even the high quality battery and the uh, car chassis. Okay. All of them, most of these technologies have emerged from aerospace domain. And uh, we, uh, we must realize, that is why we must realize the importance of uh, space and allied areas that uh, the today uh, the innovations which emerge from the space, uh, space technology they may not be immediately uh, translated in regular or uh, regular lives but in near future they will always come to our help and giving us uh, socio-economic uh, benefits so where does it all began it actually started in the year 1957 when uh, it was a satellite called as Sputnik, which was launched by then USSR. And it was a basketball size, 59 centimeter uh, in diameter, uh, weighing around 83.6 kg, uh, which had actually the four uh, trails, which were nothing but antennas. And uh, that was launched by USSR. Uh, and uh, uh, it, these four antennas uh, could send the signal periodically. And uh, that was a joyous moment, not only for USSR, but it was for the whole globe because that was actually the marking of space era. And the satellite circled around every 90 minutes in elliptical orbit. And it had uh, its altitude ranging from 228 to 947 kilometers. And it orbited around 57 days before burning up upon re-entry into the Earth atmosphere. Now, can anyone answer why uh, it, it, it lost its orbit? 
can anyone answer among school students because i want the session to be interactive rather than i am speaking all the time can anyone answer so if this satellite uh, it was uh, deorbited then why not today satellite they do they deorbit or if they don't deorbit then uh, uh, what is the cause behind it can anyone answer among school students so they might de orb they might de orbit is because they have like rockets in them which stabilizes them not de orb so so you think they don't uh, de orbit once the satellite is at particular no, no, altitude no i'm saying that um, because they have like small rockets which adjust them accordingly yeah so by small rockets i mean um, they have on board thrusters you are right so in today satellites we have on board thrusters because though we are in outer space there is something called as a radiation drag in space and because of which the orbiting satellite you know it loses its energy with time and as it loses its energy in time there is a total decrease in its total energy as you all you must have learned in your textbook that your total energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy so if satellite is, satellite is losing its kinetic energy then the earth's uh, gravitational field becomes dominant because of which then it start uh, losing its orbit okay and its altitude starts decreasing and then depending upon its total energy will decide how it is going to uh, enter into the earth's atmosphere but generally for the uh, today's modern satellites we have on board thrusters and these thrusters maintain uh, the altitude and once the thrusters its fuel uh, is over then you actually uh, then the satellites will then de orbit then so people started thinking about uh, sending satellites in space and then of course with our uh, explore, uh, exploratory nature we were also started uh, dreaming people started dreaming that why not humans in space so the question was could human travel to space but the answer was not that simple because before sending humans in space first of all we need to understand the physiological effects because the space is not uh space is very harsh in its nature the conditions which exist in space first of all we need to understand how those conditions have effects on the human physiology and that is why before sending humans to space it is better to send mam other mammal other mammals other animals in space and by sending them in space we could actually detect take physiological changes and by experiencing high g forces how those high g forces play in our uh, physiological uh, 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 physiological uh, reactions to high g's and harsh condition in space so it was a laika the first dog which was sent in space followed by albert ii the first monkey in space and then of course a cat uh, felicite uh, which was sent by the french uh, agency and uh, uh, they were sent not for uh, you know uh, uh, just for uh, uh, recording uh, how they behave in space but actually the sensors were attached to their bodies and uh, at regular intervals these uh, uh, sensors were monitored data was collected and that data actually was very helpful to design the human space mission and then the time came when the first human went in space that was actually uh, the cosmonaut yuri gagarin who was on april 12 1961 he actually took uh, he he actually lifted off from the uh, russian launching mission uh, russian uh, uh, sh uh, space shuttle and uh, he took 108 minute orbital flight around earth in the spacecraft vostok 1 and that was a great uh, moment again all over the world because because uh, uh, it actually paved era for human space missions and it was actually a step for later uh, apollo space missions and now uh, it has emerged into what we are working towards the 
uh, human Mars missions. And uh, subsequently, uh, you know, uh, when when the Russians uh, were planning uh, these space missions, and that time it was a Cold War era, and uh, it actually uh, emerged into the Cold War, and uh, that Cold War then not only was on ground, but actually was in space as well. And uh, so it, it remained for quite a long time, but then uh, over the years, now people have realized that we no longer uh, uh, are competing for space, but we actually need to unite ourselves and uh, there has to be global space missions which require multiple country support. And uh, then we have our own Indian origin astronauts, Rakesh Sharma, Kalpana Chawla and Sunita Williams, all of you know. And uh, Rakesh Sharma then went into space with the help of uh, the Russian Space Agency and uh, he stayed in space for eight days. And uh, uh, it, he was asked a question by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, Ki aapko kaise lag hai? then he said, uh, Sare jahan se achha hindusta hamara. Uh, I think that clip is, uh, that clip you can all watch on YouTube. And then we had uh, Kalpana Chawla, uh, who was not coming from any armed forces. But then she did her uh, aeronautical engineering from Punjab University and then she went on doing masters uh, I think in International Space University uh, uh, and then followed by her uh, doctorate in University of Colorado and she was in space for around 300 years uh, 300 hours uh, during her research mission but then it was in the year 2003 uh, it, it had uh, the spacecraft actually suffered an accident and uh, 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 we, we lost her and then, uh, Sunita Williams, uh, she traveled to, again, she's of Indian American origin and she traveled in space station, uh, in the 2006 and she has worked for around 29 hours, uh, in the space station and she created a record for staying for 192 days in space. So this was your information from textbook, but your textbook may not have the recent information where in the year 2020 was most significant because we had three Mars missions. And it is not about just astronauts, which are actually uh, walking in space or staying in space station, but uh, it is also actually about uh, behind these space missions, uh, uh, the uh, engineers and scientists were uh, significantly contributing to these uh, space missions. So uh, for NASA Mars 2020 mission, it was actually Dr. Swati Mohan, who is again Indian American aerospace engineer. And uh, she was actually in charge of guidance and controls operation for the NASA Mars 2020 mission. And then coming to uh, Dr. Anita Sen Gupta, she is also an aerospace engineer. And she was actually behind uh, the Mars uh, uh, mission, which was uh, curiosity, uh, curiosity and opportunity. And she had designed actually the supersonic parachute system that was actually designed for the Mars uh, Laboratory Science Curiosity. And uh, later on, she also designed the cold atom laboratory at the Jet Propulsion uh, uh, in Caltech. And it was actually the cold to design the coldest experiment in International Space Station. And in fact, today, as a part of World Space Week, we are actually organizing her talk where to. Uh, uh, today at 8 p.m. the talk is preponed. At 8 p.m. she'll be uh, onwards. Uh, she'll be talking about a tale of curiosity and perseverance. Mission to Mars. So you all are welcome to join that talk. And then uh, coming to the uh, latest uh, space mission, the astronauts who are being trained. Then uh, it is Cap Colonel uh, Raja Chari from the United States Air Force is again a uh, uh, American test pilot and NASA astronaut who is actually a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy from MIT. And he's also a U.S. Naval Test Pilots. Uh, uh, he's coming from U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. And uh, he's also chosen as one of the astronauts who will be uh, going in space uh, for the NASA's Artemis mission, the next human missions. So earlier people took spacewalk. But now if we have to materialize our dreams of 
becoming multi-planetary uh, species. So first of all, we should know how the near earth environment works. And that is why actually people thought of launching uh, space, uh, uh, earth orbiting space stations. And all of you are aware of international space station. In fact, uh, there are mobile apps for, uh, you can download. And from these mobile apps, you can see uh, when international space station can be actually seen from uh, your location. And this, uh, this international space station orbiting around uh, 400 kilometers and beyond uh, is actually of the size of four football fields. And such a huge international space uh, station, uh, it was not possible that any one country could afford building it. So it was actually a multi-nation efforts which materialized in building different modules of International Space Station. And uh, unfortunately, the India was then not part of that uh, uh, cooperation, which was uh, signed by different countries. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that the next global uh, space missions we will have uh, to contribute along with other nations. And uh, I'm sure in the pandemic, all students must have enjoyed playing games, computer games, right? And uh, so playing computer games is not bad. Uh, of course, you have to play for, uh, you know, you don't have to waste your time playing computer games, but there are computer games which are education, or education and uh, space oriented. So I request all school students present here. In fact, teachers can also play games. So I wish uh, I request all teachers also to go to this website, uh, isssimspacex.com. Uh, and in fact, this website has an online game where actually it has a, a realistic uh, docking simulator, which actually gives you idea how difficult and challenging is actually the experience of docking to International Space Station. And this was actually developed uh, by uh, SpaceX when they were actually working on the, uh, their uh, sp uh, SpaceX crew, which actually first time uh, they had a SpaceX crew, which actually docked with International Space Station. So all of you must try uh, this docking simulator. And then, uh, so it's not just about then International Space Station, but then step by step, you have to settle on moon. So there are two ways to settle on moon, what people, uh, what NASA has, the way NASA uh, looks at it. One is NASA's Artemis mission known as Lunar Base Camp, where we will, uh, where now the technologies have been uh, being innovated, being explored, uh, because uh, the technology, the space technologies, when we talk about, it is not just physics but then it is also about biology. Okay. It is also about chemistry. It is also about life science, medicine, everything becomes part of that. It is actually a multidisciplinary in nature because you need to know how you can grow crops. If you want to settle on moon or Mars, you should know how to grow crops on the lunar surface, how to the moon doesn't have any, uh, atmosphere mars has a very thin atmosphere but most of the content is co2 so in such contents uh, and with no environment like conditions we have to create artificial environment under which we'll have to grow crops and in fact uh, uh, moon and mars they are exposed to high level of space based radiation as compared to uh, the uh, uh, earth because on earth we are having uh, Earth's geomagnetic field, which actually protects us from very uh, energetic uh, space-based space particles. And then the second approach as NASA Artemis mission, uh, its uh, uh, document mentions is actually a lunar gateway where the lunar gateway will help us uh, to communicate from, uh, so any, any space mission going to Mars can actually dock into the lunar gateway and uh, then after docking into lunar gateway then exchanging uh, a few supplies taking more supplies and maybe exchanging uh, uh, you know some uh, technologies uh, on board required for the uh, space mission to mars then they can again uh, uh, they can again uh, uh, 
uh, take uh, themselves, they can get separated from the lunar module and then they can start their journey to the Mars. So till now I have been just talking about uh, space missions, but then now let me come to satellites. So it is, uh, so the satellites are of daily use to us whether it is a weather satellite, a communication satellite, broadcast satellite, navigational satellite, military satellite, or earth observation satellite, all have their own individual functions. And uh, our, our National Space Agency, ISRO, has contributed significantly in developing all these kinds of satellites. And they have been helping us to actually uh, manage uh, our daily routines. and. Uh, one example is actually the visualization of earth observation data archival systems, which is actually developed by space application center ISRO because, uh, last week uh, when it was heavy rains, I was wondering, uh, uh, you know, how a satellite system must be actually helping us to manage the disaster, uh, you know, the disasters. And in fact, then I, uh, contacted one ex isro scientist and that is when uh, he suggested me why don't you check on the visualization of earth observation data and archival systems on space application center isro and there you might get uh, more answers and there i came across a uh, online tool where you can actually select a satellite sensor and you can select a particular reservoir on within india so I actually selected the Vaitarna reservoir, which is uh, one of the biggest reservoirs uh, near uh, Mumbai, which supplies water to all over Mumbai. And you can actually select the durations which you want. And for those durations, when you submit the data, you actually get the water level variations. So this is very uh, relevant applications for climatology, studying meteorology, atmospheric patterns, where you actually know how water levels are actually fluctuating over the years. And as you can see from July, 2008 to October 5, 2021, I could actually download the data, which is freely available. And you can actually study the water level variations. Of course, this data is right now available for the selected locations, but I'm sure uh, if somebody contacts ISRO, you can actually get the data for uh, required with due permissions, uh, you will get it for the uh, you know required locations which you want to study. So, uh, so the space technologies is not just about sending astronauts or uh, interplanetary space missions, but uh, through satellite and aerospace technologies, they are actually helping us uh, in studying climate patterns, in weather forecasts, and. Uh, uh, through weather fo forecast and uh, onboard satellite sensors, we can actually develop the geographical information systems, which actually help us in uh, the management of the water resources and other, other useful resources. And that has been developed by ISRO. So one of the onboard sensor, the JSON, uh, uh, JSON 3 is actually the US satellite and uh, that your satellite has onboard uh, onboard sensors through which uh, through microwave radiometer it actually measures the water vapor and as you know if you are having a water reservoir ocean or river then uh, uh, in the vicinity of those uh, water resources there will be more water vapor and uh, uh, since the microwaves have some ab absorption near uh, for the water molecule so you can actually get the surface maps of these water bodies. And that is how we are actually able to monitor the water content because uh, more water vapor you will have, there will be more absorption near in that particular area where you are actually observing, uh, uh, you're monitoring a water reservoir. And then if you're talking about ISRO, ISRO has a Saral sensor uh, Saral satellite, which was actually meant for uh, studying uh, climatology and weather. And uh, you can see the different images uh, showing you the satellite and onboard uh, sensors, uh, which are actually being used for monitoring the water levels. So as you have been discussing about satellites, what kind of 
uh, when it comes to satellite so the satellites are classified by uh, type of their orbits the type of their inclination you can have an equatorial orbit you can have a polar orbit or you can also have an inclined orbit and by shape either you can have a circular orbit or you can also have an elliptical uh, orbit and by altitude you can have low earth orbit satellite you can have a medium earth orbit satellite or you can have a geostationary orbit because uh, geostationary orbit it will have uh, it will that satellite will not uh, appear to be moving but it will always appear to be stationary because uh, it's a uh, it's a period of revolution is same as the earth's rotation so you will not able to distinguish that satellite from a star unless you have uh, the available application mobile based or web based which actually tells you the location of a satellite and then you know that it's not a star but a geostationary satellite so uh, all of you have learned in geometry about or uh, you know uh, ge geometrical shapes and you are familiar about circle and uh, circle as you define it's basically the locus of uh, points which are equidistant from a common uh, point what you call center of the circle and that is how you define circle and uh, then coming to an ellipse how do we define ellipse so satellites or any uh, orbits of uh, space based bodies they can be of different types they can be circular elliptical hyperbolic and parabola and all these uh, types they are called as nothing but conic section so if you have you can imagine a three dimensional cone and if you are looking at different cross sections of these cones uh, so you can actually visualize these orbits from the different cross sections of these 3d cones so it is only by gravitational interaction the combination of kinetic energies and potential energy of these space based bodies you can actually realize these different types of orbits so uh, so when we say a circle it's actually the locus of all the points which are at equal distance from a common point uh, what we call the center of the circle which follows a particular mathematical equation as all you can see and uh, so when we go from circle to ellipse that mathematical equation changes so my definition changes and uh, that is when it becomes ellipse and then from ellipse you go to hyperbola and parabola of course you don't have ellipse parabola hyperbola in detail but if you take science in the higher uh, grades you will be learning about these different types of uh, trajectories uh, why am i discussing these trajectories because uh, these trajectories are actually we experience when we are dealing with uh, space so uh, these equations which i which i actually showed these actually we experience when we have different kinetic and potential energies of uh, the space based bodies so for example if you are launching an object from ground depending upon its kinetic and potential energy it will take any of the orbit as we saw earlier it can be a circular orbit it can be an elliptical orbit or it can be even the uh, parabolic orbit you know it uh, so that the body actually escapes from the uh, earth's gravitational field so these are called as uh, unbound orbits parabola or hyperbola and uh, then uh, i arrive at uh, so basically uh, it's very important to understand this orbital dynamics when you are launching space missions so for example when we want to launch mars missions we actually choose specific time window when the earth and mars are very close to each other as they are revolving around sun and that is when the missions to mars are launched because the another priority is we want to have very less quantity of fuel because if the quantity of fuel increases it increases in overall weight of the space mission and the cost of the space mission increases it also puts a constraint to have on board instruments so it is important that we efficiently describe the spacecraft's orbit 
and accordingly we choose that time window. So then how we actually realize ellipse. So uh, to all uh, school students and teachers present here, you can do very simple exercise to demonstrate uh, uh, ellipse in the classroom, which in fact we, uh, the workshops which we organize uh, to teach space and astronomy concepts for uh, school students and teachers. We in fact carry out this exercise. So all you can do is take a cardboard, take uh, two uh, paper pins, uh, you place them at two points F1 and F2, uh, which act like two focal points for the ellipse. And then you take a thread, a close thread, and uh, uh, you make sure that you place that thread in such a way that it passes over uh, those two pins. And now, uh, so this is how it should look like. And then if you stretch that thread while creating a small tension, such that the pins remain in their respective locations, and uh, yet, uh, uh, the thread is not loose. It is. It has some tension in it, and uh, then you take a pen or pencil, and while maintaining that tension, you start tracing an orbit. Okay, you tra start tracing an orbit, and when it becomes a completely closed orbit, that is when you will actually get an ellipse. So that this is how you can actually. Uh, this way, you can actually make students understand. Uh, even students can try this at home, how to actually uh, draw an ellipse. And then you can take such threads of different lengths and with threads of different lengths and by even varying the distance between the two uh, focal points, you can generate elliptical orbits of different sizes and shapes. So then let me come to some textbook uh, uh, content. So how actually we arrive at a circular orbit. Let's start with the circular orbit because that is very simple to understand and it's a special case of an ellipse. So as we know from the Newton's second law that force is equal to mass into acceleration, but this force, it arises from which force, you know, because uh, the Newton's second law gives us a generalized definition of force, which is nothing but the mass uh, multiplied to the acceleration but that force actually has to emerge from the basic forces. So in case of a circular orbit of a satellite uh, around Earth or Earth around Sun, the, it actually arises from the gravitational force between uh, two, two bodies. And in fact, we assume that these two bodies, however big they are to be point masses, and uh, you have that force which is proportional to the product of masses inversely proportional to square of the distance. And this force actually is responsible for, uh, can be then equated to the Newton's second law. And it then gives you the centripetal acceleration. And this and from this centripetal acceleration, we can then get the tangential speed of the satellite, which is actually responsible for its circular orbit. So this is called as a critical speed or a tangential speed for a satellite to stay in its circular orbit. So uh, we have talked about uh, different rockets. So from 1957 to till now, there have been rapid progress in the development of the rockets. And uh, all these rockets you are, uh, you are seeing on the slides, they contain all these rockets from 1957 to till 2021. And as you can see the highlighted uh, rockets uh, in the third row and uh, the fourth row, those are actually the Indian uh, uh, rockets developed by the Indian, uh, uh, by ISRO. And uh, one of them is GSLV Mac 3, which is the fat boy, what we call, or the Bahubali. And the other one uh, is uh, PSLV. And before PSLV, we also had another rocket. Uh, so there were different versions of PSLV. And what you see in the last row, what you have is the largest rocket being built by the Elon Musk, uh, who is actually working on the multi-planetary uh, missions. And uh, uh, it will be soon, uh, soon you will see that the humans will be traveling in such big rockets. 
so coming to the history of the indian uh, space uh, rockets we had a very first rocket which was actually with just 40 kg and uh, 17 tons which was launched in the year 1980 by uh, by isro followed by aslv then we had pslv and and in fact uh, pslv has become a major platform to launch all the commercial satellites into orbits and it has contributed uh, to the revenue and then we have gslv mark 2 mark 2 and mark 3 and it was mark 3 through which uh, uh, chandrayaan 2 was launched and uh, uh, so coming to the origin of indian space research organization the the whole origin the, the way we started it was in a very humble way in fact it was the vision of dr vikram sarabhai and dr homi baba they act, they are actually the architect of the uh, in indian space program and they realized that the the country like india should uh, take steps in the space domain and it was then uh, they realized that in the on so on 21st november 1963 the history was created at a small coastal village of thumba in thiruvananthapuram and uh, uh, it was very humble beginning for all of us and we all should be proud of that that uh, uh, the parts of the satellites were actually carried to uh, thumba on bicycles and uh, uh, it was actually then uh, sent uh, magdalene church which actually was Uh, they actually provided uh, space to carry out uh, these experiments and to join the parts of the rocket so that was actually the working office of isro and we had uh, that humble journey from which today we are now thinking of uh, sending missions like gaganyaan so i think uh, uh, it's very inspiring for all of us so uh, i'll i'll just show few more slides so here you will see uh, uh, mr arvamudan and then uh, dr apj abdul kalam preparing a small payload inside the church in thumba in the year 1964 and it was also sometimes we had to carry satellites uh, on uh, bullock cart so this is actually the apple satellite being carried uh, uh, launching facility uh, on bullock cart and then we have the top uh, technology demonstration missions such as reusable launch vehicle because we know that uh, sending any space mission you need to have uh, you have to build a rocket and if that rocket is not reusable you have to build the rocket again and again so the concept of reusability come into the picture and uh, that is how people started think about the reusable launch vehicle which can be used for actually sending astronauts or even people are now thinking of sending launching satellites from such reusable launch vehicles so it was uh, in, on may 23 2016 isro actually demonstrated the reusable launch vehicle technology and with this reusable launch vehicle technology it is it was uh, now enables a low cost access to space and it combines both the complexity of launch vehicles and the aircraft and the winged rlv td has been configured to act as a flying test bed to evaluate various technologies and uh, uh, in future this vehicle will be scaled up to become the first stage of india's reusable two stage orbital launch vehicle going next uh, so this was a kind of a sch sch uh, schematic for uh, rlv td where it took off from uh, the space station uh, on the uh, near uh, trivandrum and uh, then it got separated from the uh, from the uh, bush, um, the main the initial stage and then it went uh, to around 65 kilometers from where it started descending and of course while reentering it has to uh, uh, it has to overcome the friction and that is when there were lot of sensors on the spacecraft which actually measured uh, how the temperature uh, temperature was monitored and there were 
even other different kinds of sensors and it actually simulated lot of uh, it could generate lot of experimental data and that will help us to actually plan and simulate the next missions and the development of the reusable launch vehicle technology and then it comes a scramjet uh, engine technology demonstrator where uh, we are now uh, on august 28 2016 we successfully tested the scramjet engine and this was actually the first experimental mission of isro scramjet engine towards the realization of an air breathing propulsion system i'll come to that what we mean by the air breathing propulsion system so if you are looking at a normal engine a jet engine the jet engine has blades in it and these blades then start rotating and that creates a air vortex and because of that air vortex the air starts entering uh into the area where the combustion takes place and uh, uh, you have a fuel and oxidizer and then due to exothermic reaction you have an exhaust and because of that exhaust there is actually a reaction and due to which the rocket or even an aircraft spacecraft starts propelling in the opposite direction so what happens in a uh, ramjet engine so in a typical ramjet engine you you are not generally if you want to use an oxidizer the oxidizer can be made up of different can be of different material not necessarily air but in ramjet engine you are actually taking oxidizer is basically the environmental air you are taking as an oxidizer and that air gets compressed and the compressed air you, due to the laws of thermodynamics gets automatically heated up and uh, then it attains the required temperature and then you are actually injecting fuel into it that creates exothermic reaction and then the gases expand uh, they uh, they start uh, exhausting towards right and thus creating a thrust so of course the drawback of uh, uh, the ramjet uh, engine is that it cannot be immediately activated because it needs air to enter at high speeds so generally the ramjet uh, stage has to be supported by the initial which are the general rocket stages and then only you can then activate the ramjet process and then the scramjet engine is actually the uh, the uh, it's basically stands for the su supersonic speeds so that is why it is called as a scramjet engine then coming to the polar satellite launch vehicle uh, as uh, it is also there in your textbook it was used for chandrayaan 1 and mars orbiter aircraft in the year 2013 and as of now uh, since uh, it's uh, uh, it's actually uh, it was launched in the year 1994 since then we had total 53 consecutive successful missions of pslv so it has proved to be a major uh, revenue generation for launching our satellites of our own country and other countries so let us look at different stages of pslv so uh, starting from the bottom you are having strap on boosters and these strap on boosters have six htbp based solid trap on motors this is basically uh, uh, six boosters which later get separated and uh, then followed by a ps1 stage where it provides the launcher for high thrust and is required for the lift off and again it has a solid rocket booster that contains 138 tons of htbp so it's basically uh, the solid state in the second stage you are having the vikas liquid engine which is indigenously developed by isro in the early 90s and followed by a third stage which is uh, basically a, a penultimate stage and it uses the solid rocket for propulsion so followed uh, before so followed by liquid stage you are again having a uh, solid state uh, solid stage for a while and then you are again having ps4 stage which has again two liquid engines for propulsion and ps4 is actually responsible for correction injection of pslv payloads because now uh, on the top of ps4 there are actually payloads satellites of different uh, you know many multiple satellites or big satellite is sitting and now you have to make fine corrections to actually launch these satellites into their respective orbits 
so the ps4 stage actually uh, you know has these final corrections while actually launching all these payloads which are actually in the uh, the topmost area so coming to the working principle of a rocket so in general the rocket will have a fuel and that fuel gets mixed with the oxidizer and uh, then there comes a combustion chamber in which the exothermic reaction occurs and as a result of which there are exhaust gases which then come out through the nozzle and uh, that is how they create a thrust and this thrust it's actually a force and as we know the force uh, which actually comes by burning the fuel so you are having uh, the rate of change of mass multi which is actually uh, giving a, a velo escape velocity to the rocket and uh, there therefore you are having the difference of pressure okay multiplied to the multiplied to the area of escape you know the overall cross section and that is how a thrust is created so generally when we study newton's second law it is just mass into acceleration but uh, when we talk about rockets actually the rate of change of momentum and the momentum being actually the mass into velocity so you can actually create a force by either accelerating a body by changing its velocity thus creating acceleration or you can actually impart uh, force by actually rate of change of mass and the rate of uh, by changing the mass okay through a chemical reaction you are actually creating that thrust in the rocket and then through newton's third law it creates a reaction on the rocket and that is that is how the rocket is actually propelling in the opposite direction so all of you must have watched this movie mission mangal and uh, it was uh, quite funny to see uh, in some scenes that they were actually demonstrating using uh, kitchen based techniques by frying puris but uh, there was some kind of um, uh, principle to be shown to masses so how to actually how in the uh, india's mars orbiter mission people actually uh, scientists engineers they how actually they minimize the usage of fuel so they used actually a technique called as gravitational slingshot now all that we have learned about elliptical orbits so these elliptical orbits their their overall size is actually increased in the step by step manner so when when the spacecraft is actually closest to the earth okay that is when that is only when the thrusters are fired which results in increasing the kinetic energy of the spacecraft and now there is increase in kinetic energy so you have total increase in the uh, you have increase in the total energy and that results in the increasing its orbit so you are only firing the rockets okay when it is cl at closest point uh, to earth when the satellite has spacecraft or satellite has got, is having the maximum velocity because uh, that uh, we have studied in the kepler's laws you have you have that in the chapter of gravitation that uh, kepler's laws uh, tell us that any body revolving in an elliptical orbit it will have the higher velocity when it is closer uh, to the object which is uh, responsible for the uh, elliptic gravitational uh, force and resulting into an elliptical orbit so as it goes away from that object its velocity decreases so that is when the spacecraft is closest to earth when it already bears highest kinetic energy at that point you are again firing the thrusters so you are increasing its kinetic energy and as a result you are increasing the ellipse the size of the ellipse step by step and then there comes a point when you are firing the spacecraft for a uh, firing the thrusters for a last point in the vicinity of earth and uh, then it actually has a transfer orbit when it leaves the earth's gravitational field and it starts working for the uh, uh, lunar transfer orbit and then therefore it enters into the lunar's orbit that we have already seen in the video so similarly so the gravitational sl slingshot technique is not so new it was also tried for the cassini interplanetary mission where when the cassini spacecraft was launched in the year uh, 
year 1999. Uh, so it then had its circular orbit and when it had a circular orbit there was a point when it came near to the venus and because of the venus the satellite's kinetic energy was increased which, act which actually helped us which actually helped the cassini spacecraft to increase its size and that is how when again it came near to venus its kinetic energy was further increased which due to which then the swing by was achieved such that it could enter into the transfer orbit and that transfer orbit later then it intersected with the orbit of Saturn. So we have seen, uh, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, I spoke about Chandrayaan 1, I spoke about rockets. Uh, let us go back uh, to some special spacecrafts. So, Voyager spacecrafts, okay? And this is how the spacecraft uh, uh, looks. And in fact, the Voyager spacecrafts are the only spacecrafts who have actually gone beyond our solar system. And they are right now the farthest spacecrafts. Both were, these are like twin spacecrafts. Both were launched, I think, by a difference of 15 to 20 days. And both have, uh, both have almost passed a stage uh, I think Voyager 1 has completely passed the stage uh, of the, uh, it is beyond the sun's influence, actually. And uh, I'll explain what, what do you mean by that. So, in fact, all of us are continuously subjected to the energetic charged particles from space. And most of these charged particles are coming from sun. Sun is continuously emitting these charged particles apart, apart from the usual electromagnetic radiation. So what we actually call this as solar wind, and these are highly energetic charged particles. So, 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 so sun has its own sphere of influence, which is actually uh, covering the whole solar system. And you can imagine it like a balloon. And then beyond that balloon, you are having actually the energetic charged particles and radiation, which is coming from the interstellar, uh, interstellar space. And there is actually a boundary at which these both flows, they actually cancel out each other. They both flows match. And that is what we call as an heliopause. And uh, inside this heliopause, we are having these different regions. Now, why am I discussing these different regions? Because uh, you can, uh, you know that the, uh, it's not just the planets which are revolving around the sun, but the whole solar system itself is actually revolving around the uh, the galactic center. So you can visualize that this whole bubble with the whole heliopause and uh, the interacting interstellar wind, they are actually, you know, this whole system is actually revolving around the galactic center. So it was uh, considering the interaction with such a highly energetic charged particles. People then actually realized that we have to come up with electronic instruments and sensors which can actually survive in such highly uh, high radiation environment of the uh, electromagnetic waves and as well as the charged particles. So if you look, if you consider the sun or distance as one astronomical unit, you can see where the Voyager spacecrafts are, especially the Voyager 1, one as shown in the image. It is around 100 astronomical units and it is, it had just, it is somewhere in the uh, uh, neighborhood of heliopause, where actually the sun's environment and the interstellar environment, they actually meet. And it is going to be very interesting, the kind of data it records. And uh, you, must be, uh, you must be amazed to know that the spacecrafts are still working. They were launched in the year 1977, and they are still working. So imagine how people had then envisioned the kind of electronics uh, and other material science technologies, communication technologies were then explored and they're still working. So if, if I have to look at the top or bottom view, this is how Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 will look like. So if I consider the solar system like a plane, the Voyager 1 has gone above the plane and Voyager 1 has gone opposite to below that plane. 
and there is something uh, very interesting about the voyager uh, spacecrafts that these spacecrafts are actually carrying unique unique cds so these cds are like uh, the uh, the old old uh, old uh, uh, recording uh, cds on which people used to listen to music and uh, so what is so uh, significant about these cds so these cds are actually carrying a vital information about the life on earth so for example so since voyager 1 voyager 2 have gone so far and we expect them to uh, work as they travel in interstellar space but there might be a situation when we may not we actually may lose contact with this voyager 1 and voyager 2 and then imagine then few few thousand years later if these spacecrafts actually come in contact with uh, intelligent civilization and they start wondering what kind of instrument is this then it should the instrument on board should have some information which should reveal life on earth and this cd contains important data about the earth civilization on earth then the way humans look like the way animals are what kind of different languages we speak and different images taken from earth and all this in information contained is actually stored in a binary language and if because we we hope that the intelligent civilization knows how a binary language works so the binary language or binary mathematics is all how our regular electronic gadgets computers they work and we we also assume that if there is an intelligent civilization in the universe they must have also achieved a stage in their technology where they know that where they must have also uh, achieved a technology which works on the binary system we assume but may not be necessary that they uh, however intelligent they are they must be working in the binary mathematics but then since our civilization completely rely, relies on the binary mathematics the way our digital electronics work so then all the messages were actually encoded in the binary language and the whole information was encoded such that the intelligent civilization will able to figure out how to decode these binary uh, binary messages and from these binary messages how they can actually uh, extract images videos music and even the sounds so this is actually a slide which actually depicts how uh, uh, how the binary codes are their signatures and how these binary codes can be extracted to actually generate a simple uh, simple circle and if they are able to generate a simple circle if they are able to generate a simple circle am i audible yes sir okay. yes sir yeah i hope uh, uh, you all are not bored uh, but i am about to finish yeah. no sir yeah it's very so, interesting yeah so this cd contains information about uh, how to extract these binary codes and from these binary codes how we can extract a simple circle so intelligent civilization if they know how to extract this simple circle then probably they know how to even extract a video which is actually stored in the form of binary messages or even even a sound sound clips or songs which are actually stored in the form of binary messages and this whole cd actually also gives information how in which direction they should start decoding this binary message so they should start from the outermost circle to the innermost circle even that information is given even the cd contains the information about how humans look like a, a male and female how they look like because the intelligent civilization they may not have physiological structures like us on earth so even that information is necessary and even the information uh, in the form of images which are again encoded in the form of binary codes around i think uh, 117 images are actually stored in the form of binary messages 
so these images contain information about how humans eat okay how they smile and even some important locations such as taj mahal is actually that image is actually stored in the form of binary message the image of newton's famous uh, book principia mathematica is actually is also stored uh, the image of uh, the satellite image of earth containing information about earth's composition okay and a relative composition of gases is actually is also stored in the form of binary messages and then since uh, we all know that humans are multilinguist uh, multilinguist animals multilinguistic mammals and different languages have evolved all over the uh, all over the globe so it was also decided by then carl sagan who was famous uh, astrophysicist and uh, uh, you know uh, the science enthusiast and he was famous uh, as for his science outreach so he decided to select around uh, overall 55 languages which are spoken all over the world and you know that uh, india is a multilinguistic country so many indian languages were chosen among which uh, you can see uh, in these 55 languages uh, there is uh, there is gujarati there is hindi uh, then uh, you can see there is kannada there is marathi then there is oriya then there is punjabi rajasthani then there is telugu and urdu and simple audio messages were actually recorded so these uh, audio messages were actually uh, uh, pe people were con uh, contacted all over the world uh, and uh, simple these audio messages were actually recorded and then they were encoded in the binary messages on the cd so in fact i can read a message which was written in hindi uh, it was uh, recorded by a person omar uh, alzal uh, it was uh, uh, said dharti ke vasiyon ki or se namaskar and greetings from inhabitants of this world and it was for uh, it, for 1 minute 48 seconds and you can actually uh, you can actually listen to these audio messages on youtube they are available and in marathi it was written namaskar ya prithvitil lok tumhala tanche shubha vichar pathavtat ani tanchi ichcha ahe ki tumhi ya janmi dhanyava so what it means in english greetings the people of the earth send their good wishes and hope you find good fortune in this life so if at all intelligent civilization comes across these messages they know how to decode binary messages and they will start understanding the languages which have evolved on earth and again there is an indian connection so apart from these audio messages carl sagan also decided that let us have different kind of musics which has evolved on in different parts of the globe and from india there was indian classical uh, song uh, known as jat kaha ho uh, is in uh, traditional uh, indian classical music which was sung by uh, kesar bai uh, kerkar uh, it was actually uh, uh, in 1953 she had recorded this that had uh, that song also is contained in this cd uh, for 3 minutes 30 seconds so again there is a youtube link which i have sh uh, shared on the slide you can go to this youtube link and you can listen to this song and this cd was actually uh, it was actually placed on one of the uh, sides of this uh, voyager satellite and if it is captured by intelligent civilization uh, they will they will have their own tools to understand the patterns and by understanding the patterns they can actually we hope that they will able to uh, decode these patterns and with that uh, i end my talk uh, by this famous quote of elon musk you all of you know elon musk he says in order for us to have a future that is exciting and inspiring it has to be one where we are a space bearing civilization because it's very important for us to become a multiplanetary species and not only multiplanetary species but also to come up with innovations in space technologies which will have long term socio economic benefits and with that uh, uh, i conclude my talk thank you